Brilliant. Well, it's a real pleasure for me to, to introduce Arvind to you. I don't know if I pronounce his name very well at all or not, being that it's a Dutch name, Allard. It's probably got a West Country twang to it rather than the Dutch accent. It's <laughs> great that I ever heard pronounce my name correctly. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, <laughs> he said I'm the best for it to pronounce his name properly, so. I'll take that as a compliment. I, <laughs> I met him first back in 2018, like I said, back in South Africa, as on a sort of church leaders uh, weekend, or joined together with those that were in church leadership. And uh, we, we've connected a few times since. But Allard's feeling a particular call on his life, and he's just searching that call as to where God's leading him. So I invited him to come here and spend a few days with us. And he'll share a little bit more about that and his family as he goes. But you know, I'm, I'm always, one of the things that's encouraging when I go to join with the other churches from regions beyond is the number of younger men, Alan's not 40 yet, not, not quite close really, who God is really speaking to and doing things in their life. And they're saying, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? How do you want me to serve? And, and that always encourages me, you know, the fact that I just love, you know, we love to see that in our people. The knowing the call of God on your life, knowing that you can put your life before him and trust him and he will guide and lead you. And our heart's very much seeking that. So after he's spoken, I know he's going to offer a time of prayer, but we're going to pray for him as well as a church because we want to bless him, okay? So I'm going to hand over to him now, let him tell his story, let him bring some scripture to us and then and allow God to bless us through. So Lord, just speak through our heart now, give him peace as you speak and anoint him in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So thanks for having me here. It's so special to be in the UK. And it was indeed a compliment, Walter. You're the first foreigner that pronounced my name perfectly. So usually they ask me, what's your name? It's Ellen? No, not Ellen. Allard. Oh, Ellen. No, not Ellen. So, so Allard is pretty difficult to pronounce. I, I got to know over the years, but uh, uh, Walter did perfectly. Yeah, like I said, uh, my name is, uh, like you said, my name is Allard Tolna, and I'm Walter from Leadership Retreat 2018, I forgot the year, I was thinking this morning, 2019, it was 2018, so nearly five years ago. Uh, I'm a follower of Jesus for approximately 30 years, and uh, it's been quite, a, my life has been quite a tough journey, so to say, and I'm, I asked in preparation for this meeting to Walter, what do you like me to share to the church? And he said, you know, I would love to hear your testimony, your story. So that's uh, what i like to share this morning. And I will use John 50 for that, which came up during the, uh, the morning prayer meeting. So I was very encouraged. And it acknowledged me that that's, this indeed is the message that I, uh, I can bring to you as a church this morning. So when you have your Bibles with you, you can go already to uh, John 15. Um, a bit of myself. I'm married to my, to my wife. <laughs> to, a, to a woman called Renskin, married to my wife, yes. obviously. Uh, Renskin, she is uh, the same age as I am. Her name is even more difficult to pronounce, Renskin. And we, have, uh, we are blessed with three beautiful children. Uh, Boaz is uh, seven, is my oldest, is my son. Avila, she is five. And the youngest one is Evelyn. Uh, she turns four next week, so you, she's, uh, the, uh, next week she goes to school for the first time. So. Uh, yeah, big thing happening for us. So on a Friday morning, I have the kids usually on a Friday. Now I'm uh, from next week. I have the whole Friday morning for myself. So uh, a lot of time spending in prayer and running, running of course. Um, I'm a member of Hope Church Utrecht, and here Hope Church Utrecht is a church. I, I don't know how many of you know the city of Utrecht. Utrecht is the fourth largest city of uh, the Netherlands. So it's not Holland. It's the Netherlands. And um, has a population of approximately 370,000 people. Uh, grew pretty rapidly over the last couple of years. And Utrecht is really, in my opinion, uh, yeah, the most beautiful city of the Netherlands. I love the city. You know, when you go out, you see a lot of dirt, bad things, behavior what I've, of what I think is not according to the plan of God, but God gave the city to us. As, you know, this is your mission field. And I love all the what you just said. Is that as a church? God gave you a local mission field, Lydney in your case, in our case Utrecht. But on the other hand, he gives you a vision and, and a picture IDs for the end of the years as well. You know, he gives you a vision for the lo local community where you are located, but also for the end of the year. And Utrecht is a 
strange city style to say, mainly existing from um, the working class people and students. Not that many tourists, of course we have few, but compared to Amsterdam, almost nothing. Um, but we are, one, I think, one of the most liberal cities of the Netherlands. And everybody always says the Netherlands is the most liberal country of the, of the world. I'm not sure whether that is true, but we as a church yeah, are always trying to position ourselves. You know, what's a good position for us as church and society? How can we share the love of Jesus? And on the other hand, stick to an identity of which we think is biblical. Uh, and my hope and my prayer for this morning is that this message will bless you as a church. Uh, not, yeah, of course, I will use my journey, my example of my life, but it shouldn't be too much about me, but about Jesus, what he has done in my life. And I really hope and pray that this may encourage you and fuels your uh, individual uh, walk with Jesus. But uh, for, uh, before I start, I would love to pray with you. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the, the service so far. Thank you for the worship, Lord. And um, Lord, we really invite you at this moment. Lord, will you open our hearts, open our ears, Lord, so that, they, so that we as a church can hear what you want to share this morning to us. Lord, for every individual in the room, you have a message specifically this morning. I will pray, open our hearts, come with your spirit. Lord, in the name, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, John 15, uh, as a bit of context, uh, we, jump, we jump in an evening meal, Jesus is with the disciples enjoying the Last Supper. I think uh, many people know the story of John 15 about the vine and the branches, we will read it in a minute. But in context it's interesting to know that it's one of, one of Jesus' last teaching in the Gospel of John before he was arrested. So he's sitting there with the disciples enjoying the Last Supper and, and tells me that his message is rather important because he shares, he summarizes part of the things that he shared before and he gave them wisdom and insight and, and guidance for the, the, the days ahead and he promised them also the spirit. Um, and after the story he gets arrested and finally sentenced to death penalty but praise God that was not the final word, amen. Um, Jesus has been on a journey with his disciples for a year or three and, um, and on that table he gave this final teaching and that's where we jump in the story. Uh, we read John 15, uh, I start at verse 1 and uh, we read until four, uh, verse 8. So John 15 from uh, first, uh, first. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Some branches are picked up, thrown in the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Thus. And um, this, I, I used the NIV over here, but other English translations, which you always know way better than I do, use the word abide. And that's what I love, and that would be the, the title of my sermon, but I always, when I use an English translation, I use NIV. Uh, but uh, I think the title of the sermon this morning would be Abide in Christ. So, um, my testimony. I came from a Christian family. I uh, was raised a uh, family of three children, lovely parents. Uh, they pray, praise God, thank God, still alive. Uh, and I had a smaller sister and a younger uh, brother as well. We are still in good contact with each other and um, you know, I was raised as a Christian, at least my parents took me to church, I had to go to Sunday school as well and I knew that when I gave my Sundays to my parents, so to say, you know, I went to church, then I could get some credit for the rest of the week. So when I go to church, my parents were proud, they were happy and it gave me enough credit to do the other stuff during the rest of the week. Oh, I went to church Sunday. So, alright, alright. 
And then uh, my parents, uh, from my father's side, so my, my uh, family name, by the way, is Tolena, which means tax collector. The interesting thing is that Tolena, my surname, is the word that's in the Dutch translation is used as tax collector uh, from the Bible. So, um, but the grand my grandparents Tolena, they always had brilliant birthday presents. So when it was when I was when it was my birthday and I saw my grandparents come, oh yes, this is a big, a nice present. And then when I was 12, they come by with a small package, and I took the wrap off. What a Bible! Why why is why, why what am I supposed to do with a Bible? You know, I'm 12 years old. But my grandmother she wrote a text on the first on the, on the front page, and it was uh, one Peter seven five for seven, and it says. Cast all your burdens on the Lord. He will take care for you. Well, I threw the Bible uh, somewhere in my desk. Uh, and finally went to Maritime College. So when I was uh, 16 or 17, I went to Maritime College. And I was raised, as I was uh, educated as a, an engineer on sea ships and also as a maritime officer. So I was uh, and navigating the ship and also available for the whole engine room uh, equipment. And I always took this Bible in my suitcase because my parents knew, oh, it was on my text list, the Bible, yes, he's taking his Bible. I didn't anything with him. <laughs> and at a certain moment, uh, I was sailing on sea ships all, all around the world, and uh, we came into a, a very heavy storm. So it was such heavy, it was wind force 11, the swell was terrible, the waves were terrible, the wind was terrible, it was one, one terrible storm. It was even that terrible that things came down. So the scanner of the radar, for example, broke off, came down. Luckily we had two by the way. But, um, and even cargo in the hold started to shift. So the cargo hold of the ship, it was a cargo ship, started to shift, it was steel. And, and it is pretty dangerous because when cargo started to shift, the, the ship made a mini roll, we call it roll over, I think. And um, so we had to go inside the hold to, to uh, secure the cargo again. Which is very dangerous as well because when shifting cargo and steel, it, it will it kill you if you come in between. So we, left, we uh, secured the cargo and I went to my bed in the evening and the storm was still terrible. And at this moment I was thinking, hey, there's a Bible in my suitcase. I took the Bible, but, you know, it was the second time that I opened it. The first time was at my birthday, when, uh, a year or eight, nine ago. And there was this passage from 1 Peter 5, which says, Cast all your burdens on the Lord, he will take care of you. And I started to think, what if there is a God? So I started to pray, and not, oh Jesus, thank you for saving me. No, uh, God, I suppose you're God. If you're there, please save us. And even then, there was no big Jesus moment. I just pray, God, if you are here, please help us. And I fell asleep. And the next day, it was not such nice weather as now, but the weather was better. And I didn't have a strong sense that God was around or something, but for some reason I started to read and I started to pray. And after a while, I came home. I was always away for four months. And I said to my wife, I quit sailing. Because I, I, I felt in myself, you know, it's time for something new. I quit sailing. And we moved to Utrecht, and I said, you know, the first thing I want to do is to find a church. My wife, by the time, by the way, was still my girlfriend. Um, so I found a church in Utrecht, and I came there for the first time. And we think, all hands raising church, people speaking in tongues, doing crazy stuff. And I thought, ooh, this is real a freak, freak show. <laughs> so, but out of an act of respect, I, I, I waited until the end of the service, left the building as soon as possible because they all tried to connect with you. So I really need to leave over here. And I was sitting next to my girlfriend, to my wife, and I said, you know, when you really need, when you really want to get a clear picture of the church, you need to visit it at least twice. Well, I went, we went first the, the next week as well, and there I really felt a deep sense that there is a God and He loves me. And I felt the presence of Jesus, and finally, in that church, I got converted, gave my life to Christ, and baptized. The whole Christian recipe, isn't it? Got filled with the Holy Spirit, and finally we got married there as well. But as well. So I experienced some things with God over time, but I was not 
I, I didn't consider myself to be on fire. I saw all the guys jumping from the Lord, giving up job, giving up everything for, for their call. We went out to complete the other side of the world, South Africa, Asia, or wherever. But that was not really something what was living in me. Until a friend invited me, hey, I'm going on a mission tri trip to Latvia. Will you join me? Mission trip to Latvia. I had to first had to find out where Latvia is. Turned out to be in a, a country in the Eastern Europe, a bit more on the north, to the close to the Russian border. And I said, yeah, all right, why not? So I, I assigned and uh, we went with a, the, with a van to Latvia for drive for two days. And death in Latvia, really something has happened inside me that said, all right, you know, I really want to give my life, give my life to Christ. I saw people in the in, in dense poverty. You know, I saw a situation where you think, is this Europe? Yes, it was Europe. People with really nothing. And there was a specific moment I want to share with you what, what really yeah, stirred, my, stirred my heart for, for, for church life uh, in the end. There was, um, we, were, we had bags of food, which we were handing out, because food obviously in poor regions is an easy way to get in connection with people and to share the gospel. So we uh, went to this very old Soviet Union buildings, and uh, heating was 26 degrees, and they, uh, they uh, regulate temperature with the window, because it's all full of for full on, it was winter. And I came in this, this house, and I felt, you know, this is quite a dark place. The father was, is a, was an alcoholic um, and he was completely drunk. It was I think nine, half past nine, something like that. And there was a mother and three children. And his teenage daughter was directed straight away, you go good to the kitchen. And we were allowed to sit on the couch and, and his father was like, give me the bag of food and please go away as soon as possible. And we tried to get in contact with them. Our, our Lord, please, uh, gives an opening over here. But just before we went to the front door, I saw in this corridor, I saw, yeah, we call it a, a moth, a very it's an ugly butterfly, isn't it a moth? Yeah. This brown butterfly, oh, that one is very ugly. But it was interesting because it was minus 10 outside, and the corridor was very cold as well. So, But it was this moth, and I, I still I remember that I thought, oh, this is an ugly one. But I didn't give, uh, give further, further attention to it. Entered the house, tried to get in, in conversation with the family, which didn't happen. And at a certain moment, his father said, right, you have the food and please go away. So, yeah. And I was pretty upset because I really had the feeling that God was saying, you need to pray, you as a group need to pray for that girl. I think she was 16, 17, something like that. But he directed us out of the house and just before we left the front door, we looked into the kitchen and there was a girl of 16 <coughs> or 17 crying because of her circumstances. And, and that, we, that we as a group came in the house, not me specifically, but we as a group were an opening for her. Maybe this is a new day. But we weren't allowed, so we had to go out. And I was really, oh God, why is this? Why don't you give us an opening to share the gospel, to pray for her? And then I walked down the stairs in this corridor and there was still the same lot, but now the wings were not in a, a closed position, but it was open. And I saw the most beautiful butterfly ever. And it was like, a, like a, do you call it an eye twinkle or an eye twitch, twitch from God saying, you know, I am in control. I will take care of her. And at that moment I said, alright, alright God, I trust you. And at that moment, during the trip, I decided, you know, I will, I will give my life to you. And I will, I will make sacrifices in, in, in uh, careers or whatever to follow you for the plan for you for my life. So not a plan for anybody else, but your plan for my life. And then I, I, from then I had an increasing desire to go out into the nations, to Africa, to whatever. And, um, but I didn't get any open door. Because, you know, in Utrecht, uh, we are, most of the people in our church are highly educated, highly intelligent, way more intelligent than I am. And I had really the desire to go out in mission fields, but not a single open door. And at a certain moment I was praying, and I felt a sense that God was saying, 
hey, I want you to go out to South Africa. We had a missionary couple over there for already 20 years, and they were looking for an, uh, an, a project manager to set up a water boiling, bottling plant. So they found a water source on their terrain. And uh, uh, a lady who would do uh, financials. Now, my wife is financial uh, controller, a business controller, and I'm project manager. So I said, hey, this is not a coincidence, this is God. So I went to my wife and I said, hey, Ritzke, did you know what happened in prayer time? And I checked the website and this and this. And she was looking at me. Did you go to South Africa? With who? Uh, you? Uh, I don't think so. Absolutely not, she said. And I was really disappointed. And she said, you know, maybe, and that's what we did, we go to South Africa and we'll try to test and see if, indeed God, if, if it's indeed God's plan. So we went there and visited them. And the, the interesting thing that happened was that we had an amazing time. You know, this area, there was the, the project, what they were doing, still doing that, by the way. They, were, um, they have houses for children that are infected or affected with HIV AIDS. So, or their parents died on AIDS or, uh, or they are infected themselves. So they would be taken care of, you know, they uh, are educated over there, they, uh, so they can study and finally they try to find, uh, to make themselves supportive on their own with a job and their own house, etc. So it's a really, really beautiful place. But the interesting thing is that I was walking on a film set which was not for me. It was a beautiful place, but I really sensed over there, no, this is not for us, not in this moment. But we promised to each other, me and my wife, we don't speak a word against each other. Might this be the place that God has for us at this moment? So we left after four or five days, went in the car, and my wife said, Anne, what do you think? And I said to her, you know, it's a beautiful place, but not for us to, um, at, this, at this moment of time. And she had exactly the same, because that's what I really like, that God acknowledged both things to us. While in her heart, she had already said, all right, Lord, but it was on the way to this project. If this is indeed the place, I'm very happy to go there as a couple. So, but it was not the place for us. And after that, uh, terrible things happened in our church. Terrible things happened in leadership. I was not in leadership by that time. Um, and then the only elder that was left, the only leader that was left, by the way, asked me, oh, will you join leadership in church? And, um, and I think I'm only 27, 28, now a bit older, I think 30 by the time. And I was looking around, yeah, who else? Because there was hardly anybody in church left. So I'm pretty sure that when there were other people, I was not asked straight away. But then I said, right, Lord, if that's indeed the calling that you have for me in this moment, I will, I'm happy to fulfill that. And I stepped in leadership, and uh, we relaunched the church, Hope Church, is named now Hope Church Utrecht. And we were with 40 by the time, and we dropped down to 25. With 25 people, and there were still moments in time that everybody else was saying, you know, we better stop. We better quit because it doesn't work. You know, there's no food, there's no growth. We don't see, see people getting saved. But I really had the sense God is not finished with this Jewish community. And there were moments in time that I was standing on a position like that with a microphone, saying to the congregation, to the community, God will add new people to this church. And then I was thinking in my head, all right, go to the toilet, go to the bathroom, look in the mirror, and say it once more without laughing to it at yourself. But I keep, we kept saying it, it was not only me, we were a couple of, of, of people who really said we, we, we believe in this church and we believe that God is, has a plan for this church. And after a while, people started to come. And uh, we grew now finally up to 120 members. And uh, yeah, it's, it's such an amazing, an, an, an amazing, yeah, uh, it has been an amazing adventure. And it's really a privilege to be part of it. For example, one, one um, testimony I would like to, to share with you is that on a Sunday, I was standing on the door and a guy came to church and I hadn't seen him before. So I said to him, hey, nice, good morning, welcome, good to see you. Yeah, I'm a uh, two-star, I'm an atheist and uh, I'm a scientist and uh, in physics, so I don't believe it all, but I just, from a cultural perspective, you know, I want to visit the church once. Yeah. No, right, happy. Don't worry, come on in, you're more than welcome. 
And uh, but I didn't got the chance to speak to him after. So next week I was standing at the front door again. I was looking in the street and I see this guy coming again. It's a Rene. I, I don't know how to use his name. A Rene. And I said, hey, from all people, I was not expecting you to see you, to see you this morning. And he said, you know, something beautiful happened this week. I, I was in the service last week and was impressed by the, the people you know, how they experienced their faith, expressed their faith. And last week when I was driving to the university, I was really uh, stopped by Jesus, literally stopped. He stopped alongside the, the, the highway and he said, yeah, I've been crying for half an hour and experienced Jesus and he gave his life to Christ. And that's what, you know, that's not being proud of, but it's so beautiful as church being used of other people, yeah, seeing, uh, giving the life to Christ, amen. And, um, but this might all sound great, but over the time I got busier and busier and busier. A full-time job dur during the week, I worked for five days a week at, in the beginning for my other job. I work as, still work as a project manager for an energy sourcing company. And in the evenings and weekends, we're completely stuffed with church stuff. So, uh, eldership meeting, leadership meeting, preparing sermons, etc, etc, etc. Until I was looking back in time, I was thinking, hey, I'm working very hard for the kingdom of God. Yeah, am I changed over the last couple of years? Or in church, or church language, and I'm sure you have heard this sentence before, have I grown in the image of Christ? And I was realizing that I was struggling with low self-esteem. Every moment that I had to do a sermon, I had to go to the stage to grab the mic. Oh, how do I have to share this sentence, this message, what God put him on my heart? What would people think if I, if I used the wrong words? I had a lack of self-confidence and still from my younger years still struggling with issues with anger and self-control. I noticed with the sermon from last week here in James, isn't it? But uh, this is one of my passages of scripture, slow to anger. And, um, and I'm still struggling with stuff and I'm pretty sure that when I ask the question, which I won't do, Everybody will raise their hands or her hand, you know, I'm, I, I need to deal with stuff, you know, we're all struggling with, with sin and issues, aren't we? And then I realized that I was being very busy with doing things for the kingdom of God, but not so much with becoming the person that God, um, the person how God created me. And all kinds of questions pop up, who am I? Can God someone, can love someone like me, you know? Yes, alright, I'm standing on stage, but I was aware that's not what it's all about, you know? That's, am I available for God, transforming in the way that He wants me to be, the person that He wants me to be. And, one, and the church is one of the most mind-blowing things about the gospel, is that God looks at us, and that's what I, what I want, I hope to get you picked this morning, that God looks at us in the way He created you and me. You know, when, when I look at myself, I often see a, a person who has been busy with other stuff that he should be doing. You know, I am struggling with sin as well. But God looks at me, and He sees my sin, of course He sees it. But He looks at me as the person how He's created me to be. I usually use the image that somewhere uh, in heaven, God has a huge photo wall with pictures of all of us. There's a picture of you and me, and that's the picture of how he created Walter, or Jet, or, or uh, Lucy. You know, he has pictures on his wall, and that's how he looks at you, because that's how he created you. He created you, and God doesn't make uh, mistakes, does he? God doesn't make mistakes, does he? <laughs> Alright, yeah, yeah. yeah I know you need to wake up. Eh? But, um, God looks at me, how he created me. And that's usually that's way different than how I behave. But the question I think is, who are we? In Matthew 3, we read the story about the baptism of Jesus. Because when we ask the question, who am I? Or how created God? How does God create me? We need to look at identity. In Matthew 3, we read the story about the baptism of Jesus. 
And then, when he came out of the water, there was a voice. The, the, the dove came, the Holy Spirit came around Jesus, and there was a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son, and one I'm well pleased. And this is where Jesus literally got his identity from heaven. Now, Jesus, over the whole story, knew very well who he was. And usually we are struggling with this, aren't we? Because other people say things about me who are going about the, the things about my identity, about, about my behavior instead of my identity. And I think we need to uh, be aware that we, when you are a child of God, obviously, are a son or daughter of the Most High. And God is well pleased in you, not necessarily in your behavior. Because, like we said, we all sin. Now, in God, in the end, is still the God from the Old Testament. And God is a holy God. And God can't stand sin. Amen? Amen. But it doesn't have any effect on His love for you and me. And I think we as Christians have big difficulties, big struggles, because we all know it. I think if I ask questions, we hear this for the first time, I might see a couple of hands, but the majority here will know God loves me. But there's a difference between hearing that God loves you and have a strong awareness in your body, in your life, in your heart that God loves you, no matter what issues are in your life. No matter what sin you just happened, maybe on the road to church, or yesterday or the day before. He doesn't acknowledge sin, not at all. But He accepts you as you are. And I think that's the starting point for the transformation process. We go back to, to John 15 uh, in a bit. And I think the question this morning for us as a church is, what does my identity come from? Where does my identity come from? Is it from heaven, through the voice of God, or is it by the things from the world around us? Now I'm reading a fascinating book, and I recommend you all to read it. It's called Live No Lives by John Mark Homer. And in this book, he mentions, you know, we, um, the devil, who's still around, I, I, I don't know if I'm allowed, to, uh, allowed this, uh, to call this name over here, but the devil was still around, he tried to influence you and me. It still happens. But, you know, usually you think about the devil, about uh, deliverances, uh, being de demonized, etc., and it happens as well. But usually what the devils try to do is planting a lie in our brains, mm -hmm. in our minds. That's his, his, best, uh, his best strategy, I think. You know, he, he comes to you, look to, to fall, Genesis 3. He didn't demonize Eve, no, he came to her and said, Did God say that? Did he really say that? He's planting lies, and the Bible calls him the father of all lies. Mm. Which is interesting, because everything, all my thoughts, all everything what's in my mind, which has disruptive effect in my soul, is a lie. Because the devil planted the God can do painful things. We will read from pruning, we have pruning in, in, in John 15, and that, that can be a painful process. But in the end, it's for the good of your own, for your growth of character, your growth as a person. But the, what the devil tries to do is be disruptive in your soul. And we need to be careful for these lies. And what, is, what he says to John Marcomer in this book, you know, he's trying to plant lies. And the problem is not necessarily that, uh, that we hear a lie. The problem is that we start believing these lies. And I think that's the greatest, the, one of the greatest issues of us as, as children of the living God. And the only will, the way to deal with this is making ourselves available to God for transformation. And then we come back to uh, John 15. And that making yourself available is for the transformation process of, of God. That's what the Bible calls the way, also called as Jesus my hero, my hero, and I hope yours as well. Be converted, born again, absolutely great. But that, that's not what it's all about, is it? Yes, of course, that's a game changer in your life. Born again, you know, on a sudden moment, you're dragged from the kingdom of darkness and thrown into the kingdom of God. 
And we still have our battles to fight, still have our sins, still have our problems, our issues. But you're a sin, son or daughter of the sin. You're a son or daughter of the Most High God. And that's so beautiful about our God, our faith. There's not a single other religion that, that, work, that goes about transformation. Of being transformed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And go on a way with the Savior who takes you by the hand and says, Hey, it can be a rough journey, but I'm there, I'm around. Like the Good Shepherd in Psalm 23. So that's, that being born again is not the end of the journey, it's the start. And I had the privilege to go on this journey now for 30 years, uh, not 30, 13 years. And he will take us on the journey and then when we go with him on the journey, then we are able to experience what he calls life to the full. Back to John 15. Jesus here is, is a picture that's divine. He says, so I am divine, you are the branches. And the father is the gardener, and uh, the difficult thing, I'm, I'm a love gardening at home. And uh, I know you're an English, you're a gardening country, aren't you? So there are a lot of beautiful gardens here, I noticed over the last couple of days. And I like gardening as well, it's really a way for me to, to, yeah, to release, to de-stress, de 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 that And um, invest time, and money unfortunately. <laughs> And love in plants. I, yesterday I was at James' house. He's a brilliant guy. What do you see? They have pumpkins, fruits, vegetables. They create them all on their own. And you know, and also farmers, they know how many effort you need to put in the garden to ensure that after six or seven months, something like that, you can harvest. You know, you can get diseases, etc. So, and that's also God is is pictured here as the sort of father, as the gardener. And this gardener doesn't run around and he's pruning as much as he can. No. He's walking around looking at his branches here. Oh, this one needs to be pruned. You know, God is a gentleman. He's not running around. And he walks around, looks careful, and he prunes bits and pieces that would, that would help us from growing. But when it's God, but when, but it can hurt. Can be a painful process when God was busy with my self-esteem, but also with my anger. That was not so cut, and it's gone. It has been a painful and a very painful process. And anger is still, and you still need to be careful with anger. But you know, God took me through this process, and I, you know, and when I look back over the last couple of, of years, I, I've been transformed in this area. And then I think one is such a nice privilege and a big blessing that when you look. Back for a couple of years, you say, hey, I've grown over the last couple of years. Because that's, the, I think, the nice thing of the Christian journey. And I don't know any other. Uh, the preacher and ele evangelist Billy Graham once said, and I love this statement, mountaintops are for views and inspiration, but fruit grows in the valleys. And I think that's so true, because I've experienced mission trips, you know, that everybody is full of the Spirit. And it's beautiful, nice places. But your character doesn't grow that much on such a place. When later on I'm on my own, I'll be feeling very sad because I'm not in, in a room with full spirit filled people, but I'm on my own. And need to discipline myself. Oh yeah, I need to go to prayer. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I need to discipline myself to read scripture, to pray. Sometimes I really love to, sometimes I need to push myself to this position. And, this, and then I love this mountaintops are for views, so they are for inspiration, uh, inspiration, but the fruit grows in the valleys. In, in transforming process, that can be painful, it can be very hard. And I don't know anything about your life here. I got to know a few people uh, over the last couple of days, and, and, uh, which was very, very beautiful. Um, but God does you know you. He knows your anxieties. He knows your fears. He knows circumstances. He knows your weaknesses. And anyone anxious about the situation that's going on in your life currently? I am. A few other hands. You know, I, I'm, there, I have, I'm anxious about uh, circumstances that are going on in my life. I will admit, I'm not far from perfect yet. And I'm struggling with anxiety as well. But um, 
I think John 15 here is key. If you remain in me, and I prefer the other translation, if you abide in me and I in you, you will be much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Thank you, Jesus. Very encouraging. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But the statement, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And then the question is, all right, you know, will Jesus leave me? Because it says, if you remain in me, that's, that's obvious, but I in you. So Jesus will leave you or something. I think uh, that this is a part of this text that I always struggle with. Maybe get, Jesus gets bored after a while and he leaves, so trying to find somebody more interesting. But I think that spiritual formation is key over here. Because we're talking about a relationship. You know, Jesus is not a guy you go to and, uh, for counsel, oh, right, see you next year again. No, you, you know, you want to have your relationship with Jesus. And spending time in a relationship is key, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm married with my wife, Renske. And I, uh, just before we got married, I read a beautiful book about marriage, Tim Keller. Many of you know, you know probably read that book. Well, I read the book. And I know, I know everything about being a good husband. <laughs> but knowing is about something in your mind, isn't it? Is it? You know, it has to go from the mind to the heart. I re you know, it, it, it has to be become something of my heart and I need to desire to be a better husband. And desiring is still completely different than living it out, isn't it? So we read, we know, we hear stuff in Bible, books, whatever, that comes to our mind. And God brings that finally to our heart and makes it that we live it out in such a way. And that's what we call, what I call transformation. And the same goes for your relationship with Jesus. When I never pray, when I never go out in the forest or what, what your best way of praying or, or uh, being in God's presence also is, um, it's very hard to build relationship, isn't it? If I read a book on marriage but I never go out with my wife and I <coughs> run the business at home with our kids, it's quite disruptive for our marriage. I need to spend time, I need to act daily, hey honey, I'm so happy that you're around. And that's what we need to do with our relationship with Jesus as well. It needs time, it needs investment, it, it, it needs choices. Alright, I can't do this now because I want to go into the presence of God. And it sounds maybe a bit legalistic, and that's, not, that's absolutely not how I mean it. But I think that you know, God speaks through His Word. I think we all agree on that. But if I don't read the Bible, it's very difficult to get a picture how the character of God is, isn't it? So, I think we need to spend time in His Word, spend time in His presence, so that we grow into His relationship, that we are being transformed into the image of Christ. And all these disciplines that I was talking about are practices like a structure. When you come back to this vine and the branches, when you go to a vineyard, you will see some, I think you call it a trellis, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's a structure yeah. with all these wires, where all the branches are uh, connected to, with wires or something like that. And um, this trellis is a structure to get the branches out from the ground, get it fully exposed in sunlight, so that it can bear as much fruit as possible. And I think that spiritual practices like reading scripture, like prayer, are on such a trellis. Because the purpose of prayer isn't prayer, I think, you know, because the purpose of prayer is not, hey, I prayed this morning. Or I read scripture this morning. Brilliant. <coughs> but in the end, you hope that God reveals himself, because he re reveals himself by his word. And he's, he, he says things to you in prayer, so you, grew, so you grow into your relationship with him. So the goal of the spiritual discipline is not doing the spiritual discipline. I'm training for a marathon currently with my wife. Together we will run, uh, hopefully we will run a marathon uh, of 43 kilometers in May. So we the, the whole schedule, the whole week is also uh, equipped with uh, running uh, exercises for the coming weeks. You know, because we as Christians often try to 
we try. You know, we try to pray God more often. We try to read scripture more often. But I think we as Christians should make a change and we train more often. That's what we do. Because you, when you want to run a marathon, you need to train. You, you can try to run a marathon, but all right, if you already make it, you will um, more or less die or spend at least seven or eight days in terrible circumstances. So, you know, you train for a marathon and that's what you do, I think, with your relationship with Jesus as well. Now, when you don't read Bible at the moment, start with a minute, five minutes a day. Maybe twice a week, ten minutes. That's already a big win. And when over the time and time, you know, you grow into these practices and that helps you to grow into the image of Christ. And, and I think, in the end, to close, we need to be gracious to ourselves. You know, two years ago, I was busy with a Bible reading schedule, Bible in a year. It was all went brilliant. My prayer devotional times in the morning, it was because the morning time when I wake up, is really my time with Jesus. And um, it went all very well. But last autumn, it turned out my kids we're awake very early again, half past five, and then, you know, I set my alarm clock usually at a quarter to six. A quick shower and to spend some time in the presence of God. My kids were awake as well, so that didn't work out either. But I need to be gracious to myself, you know, I can be, become angry, frustrated, ah, oh, that doesn't work out. But, you know, be gracious to yourself. Accept yourself in the position where you are at the moment. And every mistake or failure that you make, that you face is an opportunity to say, God, here I am. I made a mistake. You know, everything is an opportunity to go back into the presence of God. And over time, you will notice that God is transforming you. He's taking things off, taking sins off, he's taking issues off, and he will add more and more love to it. And finally, as a free daughter or son of the Most High, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment. Lord, it's so great to spend time as a church in the presence of God. But I will pray for everybody on us, Lord. That you come, Lord, and that you will release a new sense of love for every individual in this room. Lord, thank you that you called us by name, that our, our names are written in your hand palm. Thank you, Lord. And I pray for every individual here in the room, Lord, that is struggling with, with feeling, really, the, the feeling of being a daughter or son of the Most High. And I will pray, Lord, that you acknowledge at this current moment, you are my son, you are my daughter. Lord, I pray for lies, Lord, that were planted in our heads that we started to believe, that we are not going good enough, that we fall short, and we, we do fall short, Lord, that due to you, we are accepted, Lord, and we, we, we are accepted as daughter or son of the Most High. Lord, I pray, Lord, take away every lie of the enemy. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, feelings of depression or, or whatever, Lord, take them away in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah.